Why don't we stand to our feet? Let's go to the Lord this morning. Amen. Ask for his strength and anointing. Jesus, we thank you for, Lord, your presence. We ask you to anoint our minds for the word and the Bible study. We give you praise in that name that's above every name. God, and we glorify you because you are, amen, a concerner of the word of God. We give you thanks. Amen. Yeah, turn to someone and say, this is, this is adult Bible study. Amen. Matter, matter of fact, it's actually adult Sunday school. And uh, we're, we got people having Sunday school all around the building. But we're going to be talking some more about the oneness of God. Amen. Uh, I, I hope that you're getting something uh, that will help you. Uh, because, you know, we may not get it all at once, but as it goes along, things start becoming clear. There starts to be a pattern of evidence as to how we view the Godhead and, and how we're able to explain it if someone asks. And, and we do believe it's important. Uh, I will say that uh, having a absolute revealed knowledge of the oneness of the Godhead and all of its complexities is not necessarily... Uh, required for salvation but because there's children who are saved and filled with the Holy Ghost at young ages and saved because of their faith and they might not be able to explain to you the oneness of God but the faith and the revelation of it should come because if it don't there will lead into a problem the other reason uh, that we need to understand about the oneness of God is that it affects uh, most of the time how we're baptized now some people don't care they'll baptize you any way you want to it doesn't matter what their statement of doctrine is and they try to say it's just semantics but if it was just semantics the oneness of God or Jesus name baptism then we wouldn't have the very clear um, dogmatic statements that we have in scripture dogmatic means black and white uncompromising statements and if it was important to God details are important processes are important and so I, I've recently was a part of a conversation where a number of people religious people and leadership were trying to make the point that it doesn't really matter about the understanding of the oneness of God as long as you were baptized in Jesus name I don't, I don't agree with that. And uh, there's a lot of reasons why. But we've already prayed, and I'll be bringing the scripture in a moment, but you may be seated. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, some New Testament explanations, um, in the, in specifically for t starting today. It's going to be uh, questions that arise in the Gospels. Um, and the title of this particular portion of the Bible study is the baptism of Christ the baptism of Christ and there are passages that some would point to and say well see there that teaches the Trinity Trinity and so in order for us to understand it we need to know what these passages are talking about and one of these passages in the Gospels I'm not even to the book of Acts I'm not to the epistles I'm talking about the gospel that's Matthew Mark Luke and John Four renditions of the same story to, with different authors to different audiences. Amen. So um, I'm going to explain the first one is the baptism of Christ. And um, from the outset of our discussion, let us emphasize four important points. Now, I have said these, uh, but I have not said them all in one time like I'm about to so some of these things are contingent on the understanding of the oneness so you need to pay, a, pay attention to these four statements it will help you it's an overall statement that will help you understand how to interpret scripture when you're reading things especially when it would seem that there's a plurality of persons in the Godhead um, first of all when we see a plural especially a duality that means two used in reference to Jesus, we must think 
of the humanity and deity of Jesus Christ. There is a real duality, but it is a distinction between spirit and flesh, not a distinction of persons in the Godhead. That's one of the points that I've said from day one in this Bible. You need to get this because when you look at it, you need to determine in your mind the distinction when, it's, when one is being made has to do with the spirit that was in him or the, who he was and his deity and has to do with the flesh. Two different things. It's the miracle of the incarnation. Not a distinction of persons in the Godhead. Secondly, when we read difficult passages relative to Jesus, we should... Um, Ask if it describes him in his role as a man or as God. Spirit, flesh, man, or God, or both. Because we know Jesus was 100% man and he was 100% God. Does he speak as God or as a man in this instance when you're reading it? Remember that Jesus had a dual nature like no one else has ever had. It's unique. So remember, first of all, that is it spirit or flesh? When you see a passage, is, it speaking, is, is he speaking as God or as man or as both? Thirdly, when we see a plural in relation to God, we must view it as a plurality of roles or relationships to mankind, not a plurality of persons. For example, in the beginning, when just the Spirit of God spoke over the face of the waters, we know, we, we uh, interpret that as the father of creation, but that was a relationship he had during that time. But during the New Testament, there's some different roles and different relationships being played. It's still the same person. So when we see a plural in relation to God, we must view it as a plurality of roles, Plurality of roles or relationships to mankind, not a plurality of persons in the Godhead. Number four, lastly, we should remember that the New Testament writers, listen to this, this is important. The New Testament writers had no conception of the doctrine of the Trinity. The people that wrote these scriptures had no conception whatsoever of the doctrine of the Trinity. How can they write about something that's never even been articulated before? That was still far in the future when they wrote these scriptures. And these writers, we're going to touch on this some more later, but these writers, they came from a strict, monotheistic, that singular God, Jewish background. One God was not an issue with them at all. In writing about Jesus, they never even considered the concept of the Trinitarian doctrine that did not even surface until 250 years, 300 years later. So it's hard to interpret them as saying something that did not even exist when they authored the, the note. Not only that, it's the readers who read their letters, the Jewish ones, which is where this all started. It came later and expanded into the Gentiles, of course, in the Acts of the Apostles. But the Jewish readers never would have ever read with any conception of the Trinitarian doctrine. It, it, it's assumed that they all were oneness to the hilt. This concept of the Trinity, is, as I said from, from day one, eight or ten weeks ago when we started this, was was born two or three hundred, really almost three hundred years after the death of Christ. And it was articulated in historical church councils. It was not com did not come from the Bible. Remember that cry that Martin Luther gave that they no longer adhere to. Sola Scriptura. Scripture only when it comes to interpreting doctrine. Scripture only. I don't care what the Council of Nicaea said. I don't care what the Emperor Constantine mandated. I don't, I don't care what the later councils said and wrote down in church history. 
When it comes to interpreting doctrine, we have to go to the Scripture. The Scripture cannot and does not bear out the Trinitarian Godhead. You have to go to church councils and see man's supposed interpretation of it. That was influenced by Stoicism, philosophy, and paganism. Go look it up in church history. So, with that being said, let's look at the baptism of Jesus in Matthew 3 and 16. It says this, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And remember, when we see the word Son of God or Son of Man, there's a couple of things represented there. Uh, Son of God means God manifests in the flesh. It was the deity side of Jesus. When you see Son of Man, it's also God manifests in the flesh, but it's referring to the the. The fleshly side of his nature. And so I want you to just keep that in mind. Okay. The first thing that we look at, and we'll, we'll come to it in just a second. According to this passage, the Son of God, God manifest in the flesh, was baptized. The Spirit descended like a dove and a voice spoke from heaven. The Bible says in Luke 3 and 22, And the Holy Ghost descended in bodily shape. Like a dove upon him. Literally. It, I mean. So. According to. The way they've interpreted some things. In the Trinitarian doctrine. The third person quote unquote. In the Godhead which is the Holy Spirit. Evidently is a dove. Or looks like one. Is that right? So when we get to heaven. We're going to see. Jesus Christ sitting on the throne. We're going to see a dove over here. And I'm not sure what the Father is going to look like. That didn't even make sense. So we've got to understand what's going on here. And to understand this thing correctly, we must understand and remember that God is omnipresent. If I say that, look at your neighbor and say God is everywhere at the same time. Jesus is God and was God manifest in the flesh while on earth. He could not and did not sacrifice his omnipresence while on earth because that is one of God's basic attributes. He did not suddenly become unomnipresent, if that's a word, just because he was manifest in flesh. God does not change. Of course, the physical body of Jesus was not omnipresent. But his spirit was. With the omnipresence of God in mind, we can understand the baptism of, baptism of Christ very easily. It was not at all difficult for the spirit of Jesus to speak from heaven. And to send a manifestation of his spirit in the form of a dove. Even while his human body was in the Jordan River. The voice and the dove do not represent separate persons. The voice... And the dove do not represent separate persons in the Godhead any more than the voice of God from Sinai indicates that the mountain was a separate intelligent person in the Godhead. Since the voice and the dove were symbolic manifestations of the one omnipresent God, we may ask what they represented. So first of all, let me just say this. What was the purpose of Jesus' baptism? Go and look at that. Because Jesus was baptized and had, uh, uh, his baptism had several purposes. Well, what was the point? First of all, Jesus' baptism, the Bible lets us know, was to fulfill all righteousness. Certainly he was not baptized for remission of sin. That's why we get baptized. That's not why Jesus was baptized. He didn't get baptized because he needed to wash his sins away. So why? The Bible says in 1 Peter 2 and 21, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, 
leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. We'll come back to that. But, and notice verse 22. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. He was not baptized for the remission of sins. Instead, the Bible says he was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. According to Matthew chapter 3 and verse 14, it says, But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. And comest thou to me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer it to be so now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. Or allowed him to baptize him. Baptize him. I'm fulfilling it. And, you know, Jesus did not come necessarily to completely abolish the law, although that word is used in one place. But more, more often, it, the terminology is he came to fulfill the law. And he fulfilled all righteousness in that there, he became one supreme sacrifice. No longer do we have to go and bring calves and goats and lambs uh, for our atonement. Amen. But we are able to obtain redemption because he fulfilled that purpose of that sacrifice once and for all when he entered in once into the holy place having obtained redemption for us. So the first reason that he was baptized was to fulfill all righteousness. The second reason is as Brother Stanley said a minute ago is to be our example. We've already proven that there was no sin or guile found and he was not baptized for remission of sins. But he's, he is our example and was baptized to leave an example for us to follow. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2 and 21, For even here unto your call, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Not only what did he set an example by baptism, but in the context right there, he set an example of suffering. And what happens to a lot of us is the first time we start suffering, we quit church. Why am I going through this trial? Why am I facing these situations? Why am I struggling? Why is not every door opening? Why don't I have a good job? Why can't I pay? What's going on here? I'm not coming against the promises of God because when you're faithful, he will bless you. And over a long period of time, you cannot deny the blessings of God. But I will say this. There, if you're going to be Christ-like and if you're going to be following his example, there will come times when you are going to suffer. It's part of identifying with him. It's, far, it's, it's, it's the part where he led, led us by example. Just a little side note. I know that's not the oneness of God necessarily. But we must understand that. And thirdly, the reason he was baptized was to manifest himself to Israel. The Bible says in John 1 and 26, John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom you know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchets. That I am not worthy to unloose. Verse 31. And I knew him not. But that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I coming with water. There it is. Right there. That, what, what, what's the third reason? Because John was wanting to baptize him to show and manifest who he was to Israel. In other words. Jesus used the baptism as a starting point for his ministry. Three and a half years. Some people think, and look, I'm not down in education and I, I'm far from where I need to be. I've got so much learning to do. Because the leadership of this church and this church is hard pressed to rise above their leadership. So I need to continue to be growing in education and wisdom and knowledge and understanding and all these things in my relationship with God. But Jesus was just a carpenter's son who called 12 disciples from a little fishing village around the Sea of Galilee. 
He only preached for three and a half years. And most of that was not preaching, it was teaching. And he turned the world upside down, and we're sitting here today, well over 2,000 years later, talking about his words. I wish I could have been that effective. But we're not God manifest in the flesh. We're not the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. We're not the one who was in the mind and plan of the Father. Amen. So, in Christ's uh, baptism, when John declared publicly that he was, who he was and who Jesus and what he came to do, John the Baptist learned for certain who Jesus was. You say, oh, he knew, Brother Burks. No, that was a sign that the Spirit had told him he had to look for. Now, even in the womb of Elizabeth, when Mary came to reveal to her aunt that she had conceived of the Holy Ghost, the Lord spoke to Elizabeth before Mary even got there and said, she's coming and she's with child. And it's a special child. And the Bible says that when she came in the proximity of John the Baptist, who was still in the womb of his mother, that he leapt in her womb at the nearness of Jesus. John, John, it was prophesied, had one role in life. To herald the coming of Christ. And then he must decrease and Jesus must increase. But yet, he still needed to know for sure. He did not know for certain that Jesus really was the Messiah, the Savior, until the baptism. And after the baptism, he was able to declare to the people that Jesus was the Son of God. God manifest in the flesh. And the Lamb of God, the Savior, the Messiah, who takes away the sin of the world. And, and so we're going to look at that just a little bit more. But that brings me to the next part of this baptism of John. And that is the dove. Everybody say the dove. And the voice. The dove was for John the Baptist. That's who it was for. The dove was a sign for the benefit of John the Baptist. And the Bible says in John 1 and 31, And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, and the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw with my eyes, and I bear record that he is the Son of God. So that dove was a sign to John the Baptist. Since John was the forerunner of Jehovah, he needed to know that Jesus was really Jehovah come in flesh. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. When we say Son of God, we don't mean the eternal Son that was born of some fictitious mother up there in spiritual world somewhere. We're talking about the Jehovah God of the Old Testament come in the flesh, which is known as the Son of God. That Jesus had a beginning. As far as his flesh was concerned. But the spirit that was in him had no beginning or any ending. The prophecy of Isaiah concerning John the Baptist says this in Isaiah 40 and 3. The voice. This is powerful. You got to get this. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the what? Anybody remember what that actually is in Hebrew? Yahweh. When you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Go back to the scripture. We'll come to that in a second. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for who? Our God. Now first of all, if Isaiah was wanting to prove the Trinitarian doctrine, which does not exist in Scripture, 
He would have said, the voice of him that cries in the wilderness, saying, prepare ye the way of the eternal Son of God. Does not say that. It says, prepare ye away the way of Yahweh. One other pronunciation of it is Jehovah, who was the one true singular God that reigned supreme from creation and all through the Old Testament. There's no separation of his persons. He said, I'm God all by myself. There is no other persons. Really, the Trinitarian concept of three persons in the one Godhead is really a watered-down version of tritheism. They try to say it's not, but there's no way you can use it and interpret it without actually believing in three gods. And there's certainly not three gods. But neither is there three distinct, co-equal, co-eternal persons in the one Godhead, which is what the Trinitarian doctrine says. Cannot be. John, you're going to prepare you the way of the, Je- the Lord Yahweh Jehovah. That's who we're preparing for. Why, why are we preparing? Because he's coming in the flesh. And I want my people to know who he is. And also, make straight in the desert the way, highway for our God. That's, you know, you can go to the next one, Sister uh, that is the word Eloheinu. Now, you say, Brother Burks, what's all that mean? These are the same words used in Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Put that scripture up there. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, Yahweh, our God is one Lord, Yahweh, our God, Eloheinu. Shema Israel, Adonai, Eloheinu, Adonai, Elohat. That's the way they say it. I can't say it like they do, but that's the way they say it. So this one verse in Scripture, which declares above all other verses, which Jewish people to this day teach their babies before they teach them how to say mama or daddy. This strict, absolute, oneness, monotheistic view of God. You say, Brother Burks, why were they so adamant about it? Because the one true God would not share his glory with another. And pagans were idol worshippers, and they had hundreds of gods. And he said, you're going to be my people, and you're going to be different. When you go in even unto the land of Canaan, you're not going to practice what they practice because they make gods, and they're idolaters, and I'm going to give you a city, and I'm going to put my name there, and you're going to to preach and share the one true God, and don't bring any idolaters into your house or marry them. God was adamant about it then. He's still adamant about it now. He does not want any confusion about who he is and how many of him there are. There's only one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord Jehovah, our God, Eloheinu, is one Jehovah Lord. That's the same words that was used in the prophecy of Isaiah when he said, John the Baptist, you're going to prophesy of the one who's coming in the wilderness. And it's the great God, Jehovah. It's our God. Isaiah was prophesying concerning John. He was saying, John, you're going to be the forerunner. You're going to prepare the way for this one true Jehovah God to be manifest in the flesh and come to this world. And since John was the forerunner of Jehovah, he needed to know that Jesus was really Jehovah come in the flesh. And that was the sign of the Spirit descending. John can't see a spirit. God had told John that one who could be baptized with the Holy Ghost would be identified by the Spirit descending upon him. By the way, if there are three distinct persons who are co-equal, co-eternal, and co-powerful in the Godhead that existed before creation, we have yet another case of subordination between the persons, which is impossible according to Trinitarian doctrine. And that is, the Bible says the one who would come would be the one who would baptize. That's Jesus is then taking power over the Holy Ghost and saying, I am baptizing you with this Holy Ghost, the third person of the Trinity. I'm baptizing you with this Holy Ghost, the third person of the Trinity. By the way, this baptism that he's talking about, most Trinitarians don't even believe you can receive it. In some geographical locations of the world, this may not mean anything. Let's just teach them about Jesus baptizing. There's only one God and go for it because there's no preconceived idea. But we live in the southern United States in the Bible Belt. 
where everybody knows what I'm talking about. John, who was incapable of seeing the Spirit of God. He couldn't see a spirit. He was a human. Anointing Christ. So God chose a dove as the visible sign for John to let him know that Jesus was indeed Jehovah the Messiah. And I'm going to read it again. Verse 33 of John 1. And I knew him not, John said, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending. What did he see descending? It was like a dove because he had to see something. God used the dove many times. It's a beautiful bird, a peaceful bird. I remember, I believe there's some symbolism here about the work of the Holy Ghost. But I remember hunting in North Texas. I knew I could bring hunting in here somehow. <laughs> Sitting in a blind, bro Brother Todd, and looking out there and... Every bird that came to that feeder fought like cats and dogs, except they were birds. <laughs> Fighting like birds. And there was two birds that would run every other bird off. A quail or a blue jay. And especially the blue jay. But them things mean. But guess what? Bird that none of them would bother ever. I watched it many times and I always marveled at it. A dove. A dove would sit there eating corn and every bird in creation would come and light next to him. Never acknowledge that he was even there. Not attack him. Not even get in competition. Make way for his movements. I don't understand it. But I believe there's some symbolism about that. About that. When the Holy Ghost descended like a dove. Amen. Let me tell you something. There is a peace that we can experience. That even in the midst of a storm. And the only way we're able to. Is because of the Holy Ghost. That's inside of us. Amen. And that was the Bible says. John said the one I'm going to see the, the Holy Ghost descending on. Is the one who is going to baptize with the Holy Ghost. It's a different role and a different manifestation. But it's not another spirit. It's not another. I mean it's not another person. And. Where the dove is concerned, secondly, it's a type of anointing to simplify the beginning of Christ's ministry. And I know I said that earlier a bit. But since Jesus was God himself and a sinless man at the same time, an anointing by a sinful human with oil would not have been appropriate or it would have been inadequate. Instead, Jesus was anointed directly. By that omnipresent spirit of God. Thus at his baptism Jesus was officially anointed for the beginning of his earthly ministry. Not by symbolic oil but by the spirit of God in the form of a dove. And that dove was for John the Baptist. The second thing that happened at the, at the baptism is the voice coming from heaven. And the voice came from heaven for the benefit of the people. The dove was for John the Baptist but the voice was for the people. The Bible records another instance of a voice coming from heaven in John 12 and 28. And it says, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it and said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. And Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Same thing is happening here when a voice from heaven speaks at Jesus' baptism. The voice was God's way of formally introducing Jesus to Israel as the Messiah, as the Son of God. Many were present that day and many were being baptized. I said many were present that day and many were being baptized. But the Spirit singled out the man Jesus and identified him to all. As the Son of God manifests in the flesh. Or God manifests in the flesh. By a miraculous voice from heaven. And this was much more effective and convincing than an announcement coming from Jesus himself or from some other man. This voice was for the people. Amen. And so, 
God, or this voice and this dove are not examples of the first and the third person of the Trinity. They had a purpose and they had a role and a, and a, and a mission, but it had nothing to do with the Trinitarian Godhead. Which, as I've said many times, was not even in existence at this point. Several hundred years after Jesus died, before it ever even was articulated, the, the authors of these books were monotheistic Jews who never even considered the thought of a division in the Godhead. Never even heard the word Trinity. The audience was the same. The baptism of Jesus does not teach us that God is three persons but only reveals the omnipresence of God and the humanity of the Son of God. When God speaks to four different people on four different continents at the same time, not think of four persons of God, but we think of God's omnipresence. How many times have I went and similar moves of God, now that we have social media, we can get a report Minutes later or the next morning about what happened at this church over here and that church over there and one across in another country. And it would be almost like the Lord is moving for some reason in certain areas all across and his spirit visited us. But it visited them too because he's omnipresent. Amen. God did not intend for the baptism to reveal the to the monotheistic Jewish, own, Jewish onlookers, a radically new revelation of a plurality in the Godhead. And neither did they receive it that way. And there is no indication that the Jews even considered that whatsoever. Amen? Amen. But the voice from heaven was a sign for the people. The dove. According to the scriptures, I, I, it's just not my, I didn't get this off the top of my head. I got it from scriptures that I read to you a while ago. The dove was a sign for John. And God can operate and produce multiple signs at the same time, at the same location or in different locations because of his omnipresence. And he's God. Without being more than one God or more than one person in the Godhead. Is this making any sense or is it clear as mud? To summarize, to the people present that day and the apostles who wrote the story, none of them saw this as a promoting the Trinity, which was several hundred years from even being conceptualized. So why should we read something into this story 2,000 years later that the original audience and the original writers did not see or intend themselves? One of the basic tenets of hermeneutics, which is the study and interpretation of Scripture, is to go back to context. And in context, you first of all have to find out who is the author and who is the audience. So I don't care what the Council of Nicaea said 300 years later. What I want to know is what was being said at the moment this was written. That's context. That's hermeneutics. So who was the author in the Gospels? We know who the authors were. Who was the audience? Depending on the gospel, we know the audience. And, and, and what was the purpose of their writing? Depending on the author and the audience, we know the purpose. So instead, this story is a wonderful depiction of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, being endowed with the authority of the Almighty God and anointed with power of the Holy Spirit. The son in redemption, the Bible says that God emptied himself out through the incarnation in Galatians, the kenosis passage. And the Bible says he became lower than the servants and the angels. Which meaning he became something and added something to his nature and attributes that never had been until Jesus was born. Doesn't mean there was multiplicity of Godhead, persons in the Godhead. It means that God said, I need to reveal myself to mankind in a way that they can understand. 
And so he was manifest in flesh and added to himself the attributes of humanity. And the miracle of the incarnation is that he was 100% God and 100% man at the same time. Is that he had the capabilities of God and the spirit side, but he had the limitations of man on the fleshly side. That fleshly body died on the cross, but the spirit, the one monotheistic spirit that existed from the beginning did not die. And that same spirit raised the body of Jesus from the dead. Yes, and he became the first fruits, the Bible says, of the resurrection. And if that spirit that dwelt in Christ dwell in you, Amen. the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. Amen. We're not going to be the actual son of God. But we're going to be like unto Jesus with, glorified, with a glorified body. And the Bible says that we, we, we will reign with him as kings and priests in the millennium. When we get to heaven, we're not going to see three thrones. We're going to see one. And the Bible says it was one on the throne, the lamb. And I realize there's a process of redemption that has a way of fulfilling itself. And we may get into that later. And the nature of what Jesus did when he was on the earth and what he's doing now may change slightly at some point way, way down the road when this has all come to an end. But he came as a lamb, but the Bible says he's going to return as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He, he's going to be, he came as a servant, but when he returns, he's going to be a king. Amen. The Bible says that he... Jesus Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. It said he is the express image of his person. There's only ever, the only time scripture ever says the word person, it's in singular. And it's person about the one and only person of God. And Jesus is simply the express image of the one person of God. Amen. Amen. So I'm so thankful that I understand that the baptism of Jesus is not evidence of a still yet to be articulated doctrine called the Trinity. It's a beautiful representation of the anointing of Jesus' ministry on the earth and an illustration of God's manifestations and roles as to how he's going to work in the coming future. The new covenant, the new testament. Amen. And so, if you're here today or if you have not got the chance to see all of these, Brother Daniel has been putting them in a playlist, Brother Campbell. And we have not shared them publicly yet. Uh, but we have shared them to our, our group. So, if you're not in the group, Come talk to me, or if you would like a copy, we can get it on a thumb drive, or we can make DVDs. But one of the frustrations with teaching a long series is that invariably people are going to miss various lessons. And when you miss it, other stuff following it's not going to make sense. I'm trying to do these as standalone Bible studies. So that they do make sense when you just listen to one of them. But they're still interconnected. So if you miss some, you need to go. And I'm going <laughs> to create a lot of, maybe a lot of uh, work for him. But you go to Brother Campbell and say, I'd like the series so far. Or I'd like number three and number four. Whatever. Or you can just go to our private group and look, look at it. You'll find it. It's not because I'm teaching it. I, dear God, y'all hear me enough as it is. It's got nothing to do with that. But you need to understand this. And with an open mind, the, the revelation becomes greater as well. Amen. And so I encourage you to be faithful, if you can, to adult Bible study. And then when you're not able to be here, I encourage you to be, to be disciplined enough to go back and watch what you did not get. Turn to somebody and say, I am so disciplined, it's unbelievable. I, I am the most disciplined... I don't ever procrastinate. I, I always catch every service. 
I always let pastor know when I'm going to be there and why I'm not. And it's always the perfect reason. It is an absolute, excusable, legitimate reason why I can't be there. Well, I could get, I could get started on this. <laughs> but, but I encourage you to be disciplined enough to go back and try to find these that you haven't. That was part six, right? That was part six. So there's six of these things. And um, there's going to be five, probably five or six more. And, 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 and it would be neat to sit down, and I hate to use this worldly term, but to binge on Bible studies on the oneness of God. You'll do it with some other show. You don't need to be watching to start with. Go sit down and, and pray and get your family, whatever. And get fired up and watch one of them. And you'll be so anointed you'll watch all six of them at one time. It might take you three days. It's back to back because I'm teaching some of these, man. Well, I know I, I, let me back up. Just like today. Some of these are getting done a little early. But that's because I'm trying to stay focused on one point each time. So I'm done. Uh, we're we're going to be out a little early. Let's stand. Amen. Right now. Let's pray and ask God to anoint our minds to receive what we've heard. Jesus, we thank you, God, that you would uh, honor us with your word, Lord, that you would give us this revelation that is in the beautiful pages of Scripture. And we ask you, Lord, to help us have an understanding of it. Understand why, Lord, it is that we're baptized in Jesus' name. Why it is.